Hello Church and uh, welcome to session three of our Practical Christianity series. Um, we are going to speak about hobbies today and uh, I must say that studying this, um, working through this has uh, been surprising to me. Because when you think about hobbies and scripture, hobbies and the will of God, um, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't make um, instant logical um, conclusions as to what such a teaching might hold. So I was surprised by what I found and I am convinced that you will be challenged and blessed, convicted and invited. So I hope you're ready for that. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to dig in. Father, have your way in us this day. Father, we give you our lives again, surrendering fully to you. Laying it down, Father, for your great glory, the sake of your great name. Come and lead us. Come and illuminate your word to us. Come and sow seeds in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I am going to first uh, take quite a hard line on it and uh, afterwards also a softer line on it. So maybe the first part might be more convicting and the second part more inviting. Um, but for some of us, it might be the other way around. Um, so let's let's look at a few scriptures that um, maybe speaks to what hobbies is. And we'll get to a definition of hobbies later. Um, but um, what I do think is very, very helpful is that um, we look at the decision, our decision to engage in specific hobbies and how we've come to those conclusions that we are to do them or want to do them or... Somehow we have reached, um, when we engage a hobby, it means we've reached a decision in our minds and our hearts that we would do this and spend considerable time on it. So how do we as Christians reach decisions like that? And I just want to read us a couple of scriptures and we're just going to work through them. And I think it will be helpful for you to evaluate um, where the hobbies in your life comes from. Now, when we're speaking about hobbies, it could be related to fitness. It could be related to food. Um, it could be related to arts, uh, it could be related to uh, series or media, movies, it could be related to sports or various kinds, things you do outside of work that you enjoy doing outside of your normal work. So um, let's, let's read 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 and we're going to mash it up or combine it with um, Colossians 3 verse 17. So 1 Corinthians 10 31 we read, um, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, now I do think hobbies is included in whatever, do all to the glory of God. Um, now, when we um, decide to do something and um, it has to be to the glory of God, as we read here, then the religious mind will often say, okay, so... I'm going to find something I like and something I want to do, but I must remember to do it to the glory of God. So whatever I want to do, I'll do. And then I will say that it's to the glory of God. I will try to be a nice person while I'm doing it. And I would thank God afterwards. And somehow we, we think we can kind of, kind of paint this thing that we decided upon doing, this, this, this job we decided taking, even if we go outside the realms of hobbies, this house we decided to buy this, hobby we decided to engage in, um, we decided we liked it, we wanted, and then we said, oh, okay, cool, so let's paint it so that it could also glorify God. Now, obviously, um, you would see the flaw in that, in that um, it isn't really then purpose for God's glory, but it's purpose for your, for what you want from it, and then you also want it to be to the glory of God. So then the glory of God would be the secondary purpose of it. So um, ask yourself this question, maybe to start out with, when you audit your hobbies, um, is the first and the, and the most important driving factor me wanting to glorify God? Did I say to myself, I want to glorify God in whatever I do as I read in Scripture, I am to do that as my heart longs for. And so as I um, seek well, how I can glorify God, I stumbled upon this and this and this thing. And some of them fall within the realm of what we might call hobbies. And therefore, I engage them passionately because 
through my following of Jesus, I found them to be glorifying to God and therefore I engage with them and find great joy in them. Is that the drive from where the hobby came from? So let's read Colossians 3 verse 17, which is much very similar. It says, whatever you do, the word whatever is there again. So it includes everything. It takes Christianity out of the Sunday box, out of the religious um, Sunday and Wednesday night box and put it into everything you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So um, here we are called, and I think it's, um, it explains what is meant by 1 Corinthians, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 more, in saying that uh, whatever we do, whether it's something we say or something we do, um, in 1 Corinthians we read whether it's something we eat or we drink, just as an example, but then it's qualified by saying, I'm mean, not only talking about this, we're talking about everything. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when I do something in the name of someone, it means that I have, um, if, if I want to go to the bank on your behalf, it means you must give me authority to act on your behalf and I must fulfill the instruction that you have sent me to the bank for. So if I'm going to act on someone's behalf, I do their will on their behalf. And that's what we're called to do as representatives of Christ on earth. So just praying and saying, oh, Lord, um, I want to be a billionaire in the name of Jesus does not uh, make you wanting to be a billionaire or you becoming a billionaire, something that is in the name of Jesus. It's because you've said or used the word. So it we must see God to know what is actually in the name of Jesus. So um, to explore that further, and this is a concept that we have worked on in John 5, 19, Jesus said, and this is the way Jesus concluded um, his, uh, or made up his mind on what he will do, is he said, I cannot do anything unless the Father, um, unless I see the Father doing it. So Jesus lived the perfect life. He couldn't sin. So anything that Jesus couldn't do, the things he couldn't do was sin. And the things he could do was perfect because he was both man and God. So he showed us how to live the perfect life. And so what he couldn't do is, and what then would therefore be sinful, is to do anything that you do not see the Father doing, that you do not sense God moving in. But when he did sense God move and did sense God in something, he wasn't held by tradition, he wasn't held by custom, he wasn't held by anything. He, apart from the word of God, that is always our foundation. He um, would sense God move and he would move with them. And whatever he sensed God in, that is what he would do. So that's how we find out what is in the name of Jesus is as we follow the living God in, in, in the way that he moves and we moving with him. So um, those are some insights and they relate directly to hobbies. As hobbies is something that we decide to do, that we decide to spend our time on. And often we think, well, a hobby is not something that valuable. It's not something that creates a specific uh, valuable output. So it probably doesn't matter that much to God. But it seems that it does. And um, when I come to the second part of this message, you'll see why it does matter to him even more. Um, and much more than we might have thought. And there's a great invitation and blessing within that. So the next scripture I want to use um, as part of the harder approach on hobbies and it might stir some conviction in your heart. Maybe some of you have been convicted about the things that you have decided to do already. That's, that's good. Use conviction to go to God with. But um, in John 2, 15 to 17, we read um, Jesus saying, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in this world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So here the will of God and us doing it comes out again, almost in the same way it did in previous passages, that we should seek what God is doing, do that that would be in the name of Jesus and whatever is in the name of Jesus would be the thing that would glorify God. And whatever we do should be, should fall within that realm and should, we, we should have 
derived our decision to do them from that. Now, um, the scripture says that we shouldn't love the world or the things of this world. So when we look at things like art and sport and series um, stuff, a lot of it we could look at and say, like, is this from God or is this from the world? And sometimes the answer is very clear. This is from the world. <laughs> and you ask your own heart, do I love this? Do I love this series that has got nothing to do with God and it's mm, here and there, it's uh, slightly blasphemous and there's a few, uh, you know, sexually promiscuous things happening, but somehow I find it enjoyable. Our sinful nature do find things like that enjoyable. So, um, ugh, you know, it's fine. I, I just rest in it. Ask yourself, rather than to justify, say, is this God or not? And here we read, we shouldn't love the things um, in the world or the world. Because if we do, and I mean, this is, this is a, a very intense thing to say from a loving God. A loving God says, well, if you decide to love the things of this world, then the love of the Father will not be in you. It doesn't mean the Father will not love you. It just means his love will not be in you. In a way, you won't be experiencing his love. Um, and you will not th therefore have the ability to love him back. Because we can only love him because he loved us first. So if we're in a position to receive his love, because we're loving the things of this world, we won't be able to love him back, which is our primary command to do. Um, so evaluate your heart, audit your hobbies in this sense, and say, what of them, are, which, which ones of, of my hobbies um, are really just things of this world? And not things of God that I should let go of. Now, you might also say, well, there might be neutral things like hiking or jogging or some kind of sport that's neutral. You wouldn't necessarily say it's a very worldly thing that's inspired by the principles of the world, which is under the sway of the wicked one. It seems rather neutral and rather good. And for that, um, I don't want you to get confused in that. I don't want you to feel trapped religiously in that. I want you to follow Jesus in that if Jesus would lead you to whatever um, and it's not explicitly against the word of God then it, it it could be the very will of God for you to engage in those in those spaces um, and then the last scripture before I move on to the second part of this message is Romans 12 verse 2 that says do not be conformed to this world, much in line with what we've just read. Do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So when we get saved, when we get born again, Scripture says the old is gone, the new has come. We're a new creation in Christ, right? But our mind, our flesh of which the mind is a part, is something that should be sanctified then. So in the spirit, we've been made perfect. Like Hebrews 10 says, we've, by a single sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. In the spirit, we're perfect for all time, sons and daughters of the living God, seated in the heavenly realms with him. But our minds, our flesh, this thing we have, must still be sanctified. In this line, it says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that it, it would get rid of the old ways of thinking, the world's ways of thinking, and it would find the way God thinks so that your will and God's will will all the more align and become the same thing. The things that makes you um, excited would be things that makes God excited. That's the end of the transformed mind so that then it's easy for you to discern the will of God, much easier to discern the will of God. God to find what's good, acceptable, and perfect. So I want you to do a hobby audit. <laughs> use Romans 12 to use John 2, 15 to 17, use 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and use Colossians 3, 17 to do a hobby audit. And some other things you might just have to throw out. Um, and it's good for us to um, when we realize that we've been in the, uh, on the wrong path with a specific activity that we are engaging in often, um, it's good for us to just lay it at his feet completely and to, to ask forgiveness, not because it's 
necessarily wrong, it's not necessarily blatantly sinful, but our forgiveness for the fact that we didn't follow Jesus there. You know, one of the slogans in my preaching life is, um, I would, I would, I, I, I would like for you to remember um, that we should. Now I must decide whether I'm going to start this video again. Again, you remember last time when this when this cupboard went open, um, I had to close it. So this time I put a little a little paper in there so that it doesn't happen again. But now this time. Um, I made an awkward mistake halfway through and then you need to decide I'm going to do this whole thing again but I think not because I've I think I've done rather well in the first half of it hope you agree so I'm just going to continue with the second half of it right now um, and uh, hope that everything has been said that has to be said in the first half okay so you can have a nice um, chuckle now if you want at me um, we're going to move in to the second part of this message which I think holds a great invitation to us. Just listen to this. So a hobby is defined. There are various definitions of what hobbies are, um, but it's an activity uh, that is done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. An activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. Uh, more activity says it's um, something you enjoy doing in your spirit pay time. Um, and when you read all these uh, definitions, you, you could come to a conclusion like it's a it's restful and joyful activities you regularly do in times of rest. It's restful and joyful activities you regularly do in times of rest. Okay, it's my own definition that I just made up from reading all of those. Now, Restful and joyful things in times of rest should start to ring a bell with you because God is in the business of rest and joy, right? God, <laughs> I mean, he, he's the one that designed this, this space that we so long for. Now, psychologists would tell you having hobbies is wonderful and healthy for you. Um, and I agree fully with that. Um, but it's because God designed us in this Wait, God is the one that designed the Sabbath. God is the one that said six days you will work and on the seventh day you will rest. Um, there's an author named Pete Scazzaro who writes a lot about spiritual disciplines um, and how to remain healthy, a healthy Christian. One of his main principles and one of the things he should, said we should engage in is something he calls Sabbath delight. We should practice Sabbath delight delight and God designed this space for us to do things outside of our normal work routine that's both joyful and restful in him and this glorifies our God when we do them when we engage rest in the way God wants us to um, and when we engage him and find his joy and find things that brings joy to his heart and our hearts while resting. This glorifies God is in, and is in line with the word of God. And I can tell you that the Sabbath is not a command. It's a blessing that we are designed to not go without. Let me say that again. The Sabbath, after Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, the Sabbath is not a command as much as it is a blessing that we are not designed to go without. I invite you to Sabbath. Now, we will explore Sabbath more on our, at our big group on the 25th of May, the evening. So please join our big group because we'll explore Sabbath there all the more. But hobbies fits right into that. Um, we are called in the Sabbath to, you know, God says we must keep it holy. It's a holy day to Him. So, um, Christians often ask me, like, but, but what, what do you actually do on the Sabbath? And what are the things you do on a Sabbath? And it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Uh, it's also um, not that tough because some things would fall in line with what um, we could do on Sabbath quite easily. And some other things we could debate. But um, it's not a religious 
activity that we should adhere to, step one, two, three, but it's something, once again, that we look at the Word of God, look at the life of Jesus, and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and find a pattern for us that works well, and that glorifies God, that uh, includes things that we do on a Sabbath day, on our times of rest, in our Sabbath times. So I like to look at early mornings and nights, as Sabbath moments as well. You know, Jesus, when he created the heavens and the earth, he didn't work in the dark. He worked, he said it was, it was evening and then morning the next day, and then God did something. So it's almost like evening and morning um, is also times of rest, times that we could add to the box of, of Sabbath. Um, so what do we do in that, in that time? And here's a couple of principles. Firstly, we need to consecrate it. We need to find a day in the week, and it can be a different day each week. Some days, Sunday might work for you. Other days, Saturday might work for, for you. Um, for me, it's Fridays, so and we started to, we started to stick to that. So I will uh, um, almost never, unless there's a great emergency, be available to um, do any ministry work on Fridays. Uh, just to let you know that we stick to that and find great joy in that. It's a lifeline to us as well. But consecrate that day. So maybe you can do it by lighting a candle the evening or the next morning. Um, have, a, have, a, have a special alarm uh, chime or song that goes off when your alarm goes off. But um, in saying that, I realize that uh, one of the things I do on my Sabbath is I don't set an alarm. I've got kids, so I do have a natural alarm. But... Um, one of the things you could do on Sabbath is just don't like wake up without an alarm. But I would consecrate it in some way. I would ensure that I arrange a slot where I would meet with God. And if you have a wife and children, help your wife, help your husband to have a slot in that day where they could meet with God. I would say that's the most important thing to do on your Sabbath. It's important to rest. So take naps, sleep. Uh, sleep until you wake up, rest well. It's important. I would definitely include that. And then I would add th the other activities would be things that through your journey with Jesus has become pure and beautiful to you. Spending time with friends, spending time in nature, um, going for a jog, um, whatever it is. But make sure that as we have decided, as we have said before, whatever it then is, let it be something that you have found in your journey with Jesus, that's in the name of Jesus, that brings glory to God, so that our Sabbath spaces are also consecrated. And once they are, then they can actually be sources of shalom and joy to us. But if they are not, we might sometimes tell ourselves, oh, I just switch off and watch a couple of movies and it's good for me. It's not good for you if it's not something found in God. Because those who whose mind is stayed on him, they are the ones who he keeps in perfect peace. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So the world lies to us about um, the fact that we, are, you know, you need to rest by doing things in a specific way. Um, if that way is not something you found in the word of God and in the presence of God, and as he has led you to real joy, real peace, real life. So I hope that's a great invitation to you to make a point of Sabbath and Sabbath delight and to, to see that God is the author of that, that space that the world, that the world um, uses for hobbies and where, where the world um, says, and uh, rightly so, says that there should be a space where um, we rest outside of our normal work and engage in restful and joyful activities. God authored that. Praise God. Um, let's join in and add um, um, so much rest and joy to our lives the way that he intended. Then a few closing comments I'd like to make. Um, you maybe want to ask yourself, well, what hobbies did Jesus engage in while on earth? That's an interesting thought. Um, I've had a look at it. Jesus specific, Jesus loved eating with friends. Okay. I love eating with friends as well. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm aligned to something Jesus loved. I love, I love eating with friends. It seems like a hobby-like thing that he 
did. A lot of his ministry, a lot of his things was done over meals. Um, so that might be something we could call a hobby of Jesus to eat with friends. Then it also says in scripture that he often withdrew into um, uh, uh, like desolate places to pray. So he would often walk into nature. He would often walk out um, into the mountain on his own to pray. So spending time with God in nature was a hobby, I would say, for him. Um, and then I was very delighted to see that uh, after Jesus rose um, from the grave, one of the things he did is that he bribed fish on the shore for his disciples. Um, I think it was specifically so that they could see that he's, he's been resurrected in the, in the flesh. Really been resurrected is that he bribed and ate with them. So um, the resurrected Christ bribed for his disciples. Um, I love Bri, and once again, I'm so excited for the fact that even Jesus, even the resurrected Christ, bride. Okay, so those are some of the things I just found if like, I had a brief look into what might be some of the hobbies Jesus engaged in. Um, but with all of them, you would see that there was kingdom intention, the eating with friends, the walking in nature with God, um, um, the, the, the Bri he had. There was intention, it was dripping with the purposes of God, even though it's restful activities that he engaged in. Um, another note to make is that for discipleship purposes, hobbies can be very wonderful. So, I mean, you could go jog with some of your, someone you're walking a road with, you could hike with them, you could spend time with, you could do something, excuse me, you could do something that, um, would cause you to spend a lot of time with someone more than just having uh, coffee, which could also be a hobby, I guess, especially in Cape Town. But um, then you could maybe go around to different coffee shops and try the different coffees while you are spending good discipleship um, time. Anyway, you could use hobbies as God leads for that. But don't, one thing we should be very careful for is to not add god or add god's purposes to what we actually want to do so don't decide what you really like and what you really want to do but remember our lives are to be laid down and not picked up again we are to pick up our crosses so the things that we pick up again are things that jesus gives us to pick up and praise god that one of the things he wants us to pick up is rest and joyful activities in rest in him um one example maybe from my life and how I arrived at something. There was a time a couple of years ago that I trained really hard. I was jogging a lot and I definitely called that a hobby and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and uh, where it came from was that one day my dad, who is a serial runner, went to hospital and um, with something happened, I can't remember. And I remember phoning him and I felt prompted in my spirit to not even ask how he's doing, but all I, I, I felt I had to say is, Dad, when you get out of here, um, the next, the next um, two oceans marathon coming up, I want to run with you. Because I know it's been a dream of his that I'd run with him. And I've always said I don't want to. And in that moment, I just felt prompted in my spirit to say, Dad, I want to do this thing with you. Um, and so I felt something initiated by God. Um, a beautiful thing between me and my father, initiated by him, I sensed, and therefore I engaged this thing that one could call a hobby. So it had a story with Jesus. I didn't just justify the fact that I wanted to run a lot, or I always oh, always wanted to do the comrades. No, that's the selfish ambition. Where it said we should do nothing from um, vain conceit, from selfish ambition or vain conceit. So um, don't justify what you want. But seek Jesus and his leading um, and ask yourself, how did your following of Jesus lead you here? If not, let it go and go to God, the author of Sabbath, the author of rest and joyful activities in rest and find your hobbies in him. Um, I hope this has been a blessing to you. Uh, so I invite you to have a discussion with those around you. Maybe make a list of some things that you might call hobbies. Uh, leisure activities you do outside of your normal work um, and just speak about the, whether your following of Jesus has actually led you to them or 
not and dis discuss them in line with some of the scriptures we've used and also um, discuss the principle of Sabbath um, and finding joy and rest in God's presence in Sabbath the way that he designed. I'm going to pray for us and then I hope you have a fruitful discussion. Father, I thank you for this time together. And Father, we bring all of our hobbies, all the things we do, the whatevers that we do, Father, we bring them all before you. And we declare, Father, from our hearts, and everyone that agrees with me can say amen in their hearts. We say, Father, we bring whatever we do to you. And we ask that you would show us what it is that you want us to do. And that everything that we do, Father, might glorify your name. That's our deepest desire. And that everything that we do might be in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that nothing we do would be from um, selfish ambition or vain conceit, Father. And I thank you that you've given us Sabbath rest to delight in and enjoy. In. And Father, I pray that you would lead us in this for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.